This month, it's big, bold and ambitious. And to set a new world record, it needs to fly. We head to the World Sailing Cup in Hier for a pick of the action. You want me to tell you my secret? <laughs> but first, it's cup time. Four years in the making and hundreds of millions of dollars in development, it's time for the battle to begin for yachting's most prestigious trophy. Who, where and how? We take you to Bermuda for the World Sailing Show's preview of the 35th America's Cup. During the five weeks in which the 35th America's Cup will be played out, you will hear that the famous silver trophy is the oldest in international sport, that the competition dates back to 1851, that the famous silver ewer is the most coveted prize in sailing, that it once represented the longest winning streak in history, and that the last event in San Francisco saw the greatest ever sporting comeback. All of this is true. But at its heart, the America's Cup represents two things above all else. It is the ultimate sailing match race. Two boats, one winner, one loser. And it's always represented the leading edge of design and technology. Never has this been more valid than today. The 35th America's Cup has created the most advanced boats in the racing world, designed for a high-speed match race that will raise the bar to an entirely new level. And while the boats may be the fastest ever used in the cup, they're also the smallest. But there are some things we know less about than ever before. Namely, who will win? Here, not even the five-time winner and architect of the modern America's Cup can help. I think it's probably one of the most unpredictable outcomes that I've ever experienced. You know, these teams are very equally matched. Um, it's going to be a very close contest, I think, particularly amongst the, 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 the finalists. Yeah, and I'm honestly not sure who's going to win this. Since the last America's Cup in 2013, teams have been busy racing identical 45-footers in the America's Cup World Series. Ultimately, the America's Cup is a match race between the defender, in this case Oracle Team USA, and a challenger. The first phase of the competition involves selecting the best challenger from the five teams that threw down the gauntlet. The successful team then goes on to take on Oracle Team USA. Racing will take place on the Great Sound in Bermuda, where teams will go head-to-head -head in a series of match racing flights. Having won the America's Cup World Series overall, Land Rover BAR starts the qualifiers with a two-point advantage. Oracle Team USA came second and has a one-point advantage. The road to the cup involves three phases. The first is the qualifiers, a double round robin where teams race each other twice. This racing includes Oracle Team USA. The lowest scoring challenger is eliminated. And the defender, Oracle Team USA, then plays no further part until the America's Cup itself. The Challenger Playoffs is a knockout phase between the four teams. Each match is a first of five series to select the Challenger. Then it's on to the America's Cup match, a first to seven series. So who are the teams? After a difficult and traumatic America's Cup in 2013, Artemis Racing has frequently delivered impressive results, but without the consistent performance they would have liked until now. During the practice racing, the team dominated the results, pointing towards a new level of performance. Emirates Team New Zealand set the foiling agenda for the last America's Cup and came within one race of winning, before Oracle Team USA snatched victory in the most dramatic manner. Well known for their innovative style, the Kiwis are nevertheless as capable of winning the Cup as they are crashing out. Last to the party, and believed to have the smallest budget, one of Group Armour Team France's greatest assets is its skipper, 
Frank Camas, one of the world's most versatile and accomplished sailors. When it comes to raw, hands-on feel, the French team has plenty going for it. Led by the world's most successful Olympic sailor, Sir Ben Ainsley, Land Rover BAR has taken a technical and clinical approach to its campaign. Despite winning the America's Cup World Series, they've struggled to deliver results in the recent practice racing. Yet only a fool would write the master of comebacks off. SoftBank Team Japan is led by one of the most experienced America's Cup skippers in the fleet. In five previous Cup campaigns at the wheel, Dean Barker has tasted both victory and defeat. Buying design packages from Oracle Team USA at the start of the cycle gave his team an early advantage. Skipper and helmsman Jimmy Spithill is the hard nut of the cup. Nicknamed the Pitbull, his focused determination along with the team's comeback in San Francisco makes them a strong defender. Well funded and well stocked with talent on and off the water, they appear to have it all. Yet they failed to win a single America's Cup World Series event and finished second overall. And in the Cup, there is no second. While foiling technology has been the big focus so far, some believe the secret to success is now shifting. That whole technique side of it is probably going to be at least 80% of, of, of this America's Cup, irrespective of, of the technology. I think the last America's Cup was, for the most part, about how people use the technology, how they make the best use of it. The technology between the two finalists was actually remarkably close in many ways. But how they used the technology was, was why we saw the big shift in performance, and I think we're still seeing that today. The human-machine interface between the crew and their sophisticated systems is what teams have been working on most recently. The boat's really technical. Um, really difficult to sail and the thing that keeps them foiling so nicely is the control system and everyone hears of this word control system but what does it actually really mean? Well, well basically the, the flight control system is um, from a, an end user perspective, from, from my perspective is a bunch of buttons that you, you push and they send different commands to, to the foils. Um, you know, so I can push buttons on the wheel that adjust the lure dagger board, changes the rake of it, um, I also have buttons that adjust the rudders and I have buttons that adjust sort of both at the same time. So it is a very complex um, control system. I think I've got somewhere over 20 buttons on the wheel um, mounted in various different spots and it's been a huge project. You spend a lot of time with um, control systems engineers and um, boat builders to be frank in the, in the team coming in saying I need to move the button two inches to the left and they look at you and they roll their eyes and they're like what do you mean? How can two inches make a difference? But you know, when you are doing 35 knots and you need to pull off a foiling jibe and, and hit it spot on, if you have to move your hand from one button to reach another button it just doesn't work. And then you've got a number of foot buttons below the wheel as well which control dropping and lifting the boards and um, bleeding the cant and all this stuff. So. Yeah, it's a, a full-time job at the back and then sometime after this whole trying to just fly the boat and make it go quick, you've got to think about where the other boat is. All the teams have been considering the same issue, but Land Rover BAR believe they have a solution that will take them onto another level. The wheel encompasses a whole lot more in terms of the control of the systems on the boat and, and the, the foils, the daggerboard and the rudder. And The easier those are to control, then the more stable the boat will be and the, and the faster it will go. Well, the shape of the wheel, it's, it's obviously circular as it has to be uh, within, within the rules, um, but it's moulded uh, you know, specifically to fit uh, my, my grip. Uh, also, a lot of the control um, paddles and system on the wheel that we've developed over the last couple of years as we've been sailing these boats to try and get a much more sort of intuitive control for the foils on the boat to keep the flight of the boat as it should be at many different states and through many different manoeuvres. Uh, but where it differs from other teams, or certainly wheels on other boats, is that we have the interaction with the paddles tick tapped inside the rim. This means actually that it's close to the controls, it's close to the fingertips. When you operate the wheel, it feels like you're changing a gear in a car. Others have taken a different approach to engineering an advantage. 
Generating enough power to drive the hydraulic systems is a problem that all the teams face. Emirates Team New Zealand hope to increase their efficiency after fitting cockpit-mounted bicycles instead of the conventional grinding pedestals. Having developed the system in secret at the home base on Auckland, they were the last team to arrive in Bermuda. And when they did, they attracted plenty of attention. Well, there was a few boats out, but you're going to get that, and that's a good thing. You know, we watch them, they watch us, but now there's just a lot more people watching you. And, and also, uh, locals out in their boats too. But aside from the technology arms race, there's another big change for all. The switch from fleet racing to match racing. Now our focus completely shifts to match racing, which, you know, for most people probably doesn't mean a whole lot, but it's a completely different game now. Um, you can't just go around the course sailing conservatively trying to get seconds and thirds and hoping to win the event. You're either going to win a race or you're going to lose a race. Probably the biggest thing is the whole start procedure, you know, the dogfight as you will in the pre-start where you're trying to either win the windward or the leeward end of the line or hook the other boat or just get an even start and um, that's our biggest area that we need to improve is the starting. Usually once we get round mark one and the race begins, um, we're feeling pretty confident. You'll see higher risk sailing involved. When you're behind, you have to throw in that difficult manoeuvre to, to get back into it. So it's, it's, it is a very different type of racing. But for all the high technology, big budgets and technical sophistication, trip up and the game could be over. A breakdown, capsize or man overboard could easily define this cup. Keeping the boat up the right way and the crew on board has raised the stakes even higher for the 35th America's Cup. After the break, the 15-tonne flying trimaran. But first, for anyone with Olympic aspirations, it was a crucial event. Succeed in the air and a place at the World Cup Series final in Santander would be in the bag. Stay with us for part two to find out who shone. As the World Cup Series final in Santander, Spain draws nearer, attention starts to focus on teams that might have what it takes for the 2020 Games. Yet getting to Spain and staking a claim involved more than simply making an entry. Only the top half of the World Cup fleet would make the grade. And hier on the French Mediterranean was the last chance to shine. Stay with us to find out who made the headlines. When France's Joyon's team smashed the record for a non-stop circumnavigation earlier this year, it was clear that to do better would require a radical approach. At just under 41 days, IDEC had achieved a blistering pace, averaging almost 27 knots for 26,000 miles. Many now believe there is only one way to beat this record, with hydrofoils. While foils are becoming popular in the sport, taking them offshore is a different deal. There have been few attempts. The best known was Lee Dropter, the former record holder of the world sailing speed record. But no one has yet taken on the world until now. Led by experienced offshore sailor Seb Jos, the Gitana team is about to launch a foiling beast to do just that. Designed by Guillaume Verdier, the new 32-metre trimaran is an ambitious project even before the foils are considered. Developing sufficient power to propel a 15-tonne trimaran at speeds over 70 kilometres per hour is a task in itself. Getting it to fly in big seas deep in the Southern Ocean takes the project into more ambitious territory. Forcément, on a le track. C'est très rare, on a une chance exceptionnelle. Peut-être que c'est un projet comme ça qu'on fait dans notre vie. 
pense qu'on est les défricheurs aujourd'hui. Et l'avenir, il est sur des bateaux de contrôlage volant, genre, ça, ça, ça ne fait aucun doute. Ce qu'on a vu aujourd'hui sur la Coupe de l'Amérique, nous a montré que justement on pouvait, euh, on pouvait faire des bateaux volants et donc c'est ce qu'on est en train de, de développer. But it's not until you see the new trimaran in construction that you appreciate the scale of the task. And yet the size isn't the biggest challenge for the team. Ce qui est compliqué c'est de faire un peu euh, un, un deux en un on va dire. À la base on veut déjà un bateau qui marche très bien en, en mode archimédien parce qu'on essaye de faire voler un trimaran. A task that has required a huge amount of time. Le retour d'expérience de Gitana 15 nous a quand même permis de valider des choix et je serais sûrement moins confiant aujourd'hui pour sortir un bateau comme ça qui est quand même architecturalement assez différent de tous les autres. C'est des formes un peu agressives, présent U, voilà, des coques plutôt planantes. Étape par étape, on défriche, on développe et on s'oriente vers la voile de demain. Le futur, on l'a déjà inventé avec le vol de Gitana 15. Je pense que beaucoup de monde euh, n'imaginait pas qu'on puisse faire voler un, un trimaran de, de course sur large. Le bateau, il peut atteindre des 40 nœuds assez facilement, même sans voler, donc euh, on va avoir un petit temps d'adaptation. Quand on arrive chez Multiplas et qu'on voit que, que les dessins 3D ont pris forme, c'est toujours, euh, toujours une phase hyper émouvante. On se frotte les yeux, on se dit ça y est, est, ça, y est ça existe. C'est la première fois que le Gitana Team part sur un gros bateau comme celui-ci. On fait quelque chose qui n'a jamais été fait. Si ce bateau-là fonctionne comme on le souhaite, ça sera un vrai, un vrai pas en avant pour, pour les multicoques de course au large. On essaye d'être ambitieux, on essaye d'être audacieux. On a la chance effectivement d'avoir de, des armateurs Ariane et Benjamin Rothschild qui en plus nous, nous, nous poussent dans nos, dans nos retranchements. Parce que c'est la, la genèse même de, de cette famille, c'est de nous emmener dans des, dans, des, dans des choses qui sont juste incroyables et innovantes. The new Maxi Gitana is due to be launched in July. Hier, on the French Mediterranean, played host to round two of the 2017 World Cup Series. As always, the event saw a week of intense racing among the 10 Olympic classes as teams fought to make the cut for the medal race finale. There were also two additional classes taking part, the 2.4 metre Norlin One design and the high-speed, high-flying foiling kite balls. For any team with Olympic aspirations, every World Cup Series event is important. But hier was also the final chance to make the grade for the World Cup Series final in Santander, Spain. The pressure was on. Light and shifty conditions hadn't troubled Martine Grail and Kehena Kunz all week as they continued their dominance of the FX fleet. The Brazilian pair currently own the 49er FX class and took gold with ease, despite a near slip-up at the end of the medal race. Behind them, Jorsok and Lorenz from Germany playing silver, with British sailors Dobson and Tidy taking bronze. Having led the field for much of the week, Swiss sailor Matteo Sanz suffered a late-night drama in the RSX men's fleet when he was disqualified from the penultimate race. This left Frenchman Louis Giard 15 points clear going into the medal race, a margin he capitalised on to take gold. Sanz's problems were compounded with a poor start, which opened the door for Piotr Mishka to take silver and Kieran Badlow to take bronze. <laughs> In the NACRA 17 fleet, it was a three-way fight for gold, with Spain, France and Denmark in the running. Spain's Fernando Echavari and Tara Pacheo fired off the start line at speed and took an early lead that he and his crew never gave back to take gold. 
Yeah, we are really, really happy. I mean, uh, it was a really hard race with uh, very beautiful uh, conditions, but we have to, to fight hard. Um, and we did uh, basically what we thought at the beginning uh, before uh, starting, and everything went so well, so we are really happy about the job. In the women's 470 fleet, Dutch sailors Aphrodite Ziegers and Anneloes van Veen were on a roll. Having won the Miami event in January, they then took gold at the next Olympic classes regatta in Parma. By the end of the week in Ier, they carved out a 19-point lead, enough to guarantee gold. Although three boats were racing for the remaining two medals, as the race unfolded, it was the Spanish pair, Mas and Chantero, who got into the leading pack to take silver, forcing the Swiss sailors, Farni and Siegenthaler into bronze. The Finn fleet saw one of the biggest scramble for medals with eight of the ten boats technically able to win a medal. But after a tricky light airs race, it was Alakan Kayar from Turkey who continued a week of winning ways and took gold over Nicolas Heiner from the Netherlands in silver and Frenchman Jonathan Lobert in bronze. In the 2.4 meter, it was no surprise to see Damien Seguin at the front of the fleet, dominating racing once again. This prompted some to ask what his secret was. You want me to tell you my secret? <laughs> uh, yeah, my secret is to be enjoying the weather. Yeah, it's, it's the most important for me. And uh, this year, we have some new sailor, uh, and it's important for me to be here with this new sailor. Next stop for the 2.4s is Germany for the Para World Sailing Championships in Kiel. For the others, it's on to Spain for the World Cup Series final in Santander. Next month, who won and how? We report from Bermuda on how the oldest trophy in international sport was won or lost in our World Sailing Show Cup special.